Thanks for joining us online today. We are really glad you're here. Core Church is a place of hope, healing, peace, and purpose. And if you don't have a church home, we'd love for you to join us Sundays at 10 a.m. And if we can help you in any way through prayer or support, we want to encourage you to use the links that are in the description. Thanks for joining us, and we pray this message both encourages and inspires you. Well, today is a glorious day. Do you agree with me? Amen. Man, who's ready to run out of that grave today? We're not staying in that grave any longer. Well, I'm glad that you're here today. My name is Paula, and I'm one of the pastors. And today, uh, we are in our last day of a series called The Altars of Asa. And we're going to be in the book of 2 Chronicles in chapter 16, if you wanna get a head start to there. If you don't have a Bible, we have some out in the lobbies that, that they're free for you. Or you can download either Version or Bible Hub. They're two great apps to have. Version is the app that we use for our daily devotions that we go through as a church. This sermon series is based on our core practice of Sunday worship. We gather to experience the presence of God with the people of God. Pastor Brad uh, started the sermon series with a, a sermon called Remove the Altars. Asa, who we've been talking about, King Asa, he was king over God's people and they were worshiping idols and other gods and he called them back to worship God and they removed the idols. So ba Pastor Brad talked about what is it in our life that we need to remove? What are the things in our life that uh, trip us up and, and try to keep us away from coming in and worshiping together? Then last week, he talked about repair the altars. This is the second thing that Asa did is he repaired the altar. And we repair our altars by worshiping and seeking the Lord. And today, we're going to talk about return to the altar. So uh, this is at the, the scripture we're going to be reading is at the end of King Ace's reign as king. It's the end of his life. And he's been a good king. He's been a godly king, a godly man. He started out great. He, he was king for 41 years and he started out great. He trusted God. He was fully committed to God. But later in his life, he lost his passion for God and he stopped trusting God. He stopped being fully committed. And he even, scripture tells us that he even stopped praying altogether. And the thing is that this can happen to any of us. Like we, uh, our word for this year is fresh fire, the fresh fire of the Holy Spirit. We're believing for that fresh fire of the Holy Spirit. And some of you have experienced that. Like you have experienced the fresh fire of the Holy Spirit and you have that passion for God, but you wanna protect it. You don't wanna lose it. And some of you, you've never experienced the fresh fire of the Holy Spirit and you want it. And then some of you, you've had it, but you don't know what's happened to it. That passion has gone out. So we're gonna look at King Asa, see what we can learn from him. We're gonna read his story and then unpack it. And we're gonna start at verse seven. At that time, Hanani, the seer, a seer is a prophet who sees visions. So Hanani is a prophet that is sent by God to speak to Asa. He came to King Asa and told him, because you have put your trust in the king of Aram instead of the Lord your God, you missed your chance to destroy the, uh, the army of king of Aram. Don't you remember what happened to the Ethiopians and Libyans and their vast army with all of their chariots and charioteers? A charioteer is someone who drives a chariot. I had to look that up. Uh, at, that, at that time, you relied on the Lord and he handed them over to you. So the prophet is reminding Asa of a time when he trusted God and he's saying, but now you're, doubt, you're doubting God. Verse nine, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. What a fool you've been. For now on, you'll be at war. 
Asa became so angry with Hanani for saying this that he threw him into prison and put him in stocks. At that time, Asa also began to oppress his people. Let's pray together. God, I know that you have a word for us this morning and right now we just wanna open ourselves up to that. Just open up our hearts and our ears to hear what you have to say to us. God, I just ask that the Holy Spirit speak through me, just get me out of the way. And we praise you for the word that you have for us and the, the transformation, the change that you will do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, if you're new here, um, I am married to Curtis and we live, sorry, I don't know why I found that funny, but somebody else did too. <laughs> Um, Curtis and I live out in the country and we have raised five boys. And if there's one thing that you need to have when you're out in the country with boys, that's a four-wheeler. So we have a four-wheeler and a couple of weeks ago, Curtis was out on the four-wheeler and I was inside the house and I, I heard him driving the four-wheeler. And so I ran out there and I jumped on the four-wheeler with him. Now you have to understand, my perspective of this moment is that, um, this is romantic. Like I'm on this four-wheeler with the man I love. He's my knight in shining armor. We're gonna ride off into the sunset together. His perspective is quite different. His perspective is, this is my chance to scare the living daylights out of Paula. Now he didn't do that this time, but he did make the comment that it's been a long time since you've been on the four-wheeler with me. And I said, yeah, it has been a long time. And there's good reason for that. The last time I was on the four-wheeler with him, he thought it would be funny to gun it as I was trying to get on it. So I never quite made it on the four-wheeler. I was only halfway on. One leg was up over the seat, and I'm hanging on to the side now, hanging on to him, but I'm leaning off to the side of the four-wheeler, and he just takes off. And he goes <laughs> over a pile of gravel that we had a big pile, okay? So he ramps up over this pile of gravel, comes down the side, comes off that gravel on two wheels. It was terrifying. He thought it was hilarious. And to this day, he is still proud of it. <laughs> and here's the thing. It took me a long time to get on that four-wheeler with him again. It took me a long time to, to trust that again. And I trust this man. We have a strong marriage. He's a good man. And I trust him in every area of my life, except with the four-wheeler, I have my doubts. And I think this is how we are with God. My God, I trust you. I trust you with my life. I trust you in every area, except this one area. I have my doubts. And for you, it may be financial. Like maybe uh, you, you believe God, you trust that God is your provider. You know that he's going to um, give everything that you need. That when the bills are due, you're going to be able to pay it. And you trust him as your provider. But when it comes to giving, when it comes to being a generous giving, when it comes to what Pastor Eric talked about, um, tithing, giving 10%, I have my doubts. I mean, if I give 10% of my income, will I be able to put food on my table? Will I be able to put gas in my car to go to work? I trust you, God. I know you're my provider, but I have my doubts. Maybe for you, it's, it's more of an emotional issue. You've had a pain, you've had a hurt and you know that God can heal you, but you have your doubts, so you hold on to it. Maybe for you, it's a, it's a relationship. Like you have a relationship that is just not going well. It's, in fact, it's really bad. And you know that God can restore that, but it's been a long time. It doesn't look good. And you have your doubts. Or maybe you're, you're praying and you're believing for a godly relationship. 
but it's just taking too long and, and you have your doubts. When doubt sets in, we can be like Asa and we can stop trusting God and we can even stop praying. And for you, it, it may not just be one area that you have your doubts, but just in general, like you're struggling with your relationship with God. You just, you have a lot of doubts about God, about who he is. The definition of doubt is doubt is indecision. This means I, I can't quite decide. It's indecision between belief and disbelief. In the book of Mark, there was a, a man who went up to Jesus and he said, I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. He had doubts. We all have doubts. I want you to write this down. Am I doubting or am I trusting? Am I doubting or trusting? Last week, Pastor Brad talked about uh, God's people that they had divided into two kingdoms. Now, God's people had been one kingdom. They'd all been under one king. So when Saul was king, when David was king, when Solomon was king, all of God's people were under one kingdom with one king. But at one point, they split. They divided into two kingdoms. Neither kingdom were doing what was pleasing to God. Both kingdoms, God's people, were worshiping other idols and other gods. But do you know what caused this split, what caused this division into two kingdoms? It was the issue over taxes. Some of the people wanted higher taxes. Some of the people wanted lower taxes. Does this sound familiar at all? The two kingdoms, they even carved out idols. One of the kingdoms had a donkey and the other kingdom had an elephant. You might have to fact check me on that one. But what fascinates me about this is that the year was 900 BC. This is over 3,000 years ago. And today, God's people are still divided. Not God's people against the world, but God's people against God's people still divided over the same issue. The problem is that this, this was a political division, but it caused a spiritual division because now God's people are no longer worshiping together. I hear people today, I hear them say, what is the world coming to? What is the world coming to? I'm here to tell you the world's not coming to anything. It's always been like this from the beginning because we have an enemy who has a real tactic to divide God's people. And it is a deep-seated tactic that we see throughout history. And I, I know that we have concerns about our country and we have concerns about the world, and we should. We should have concerns. But we have to ask ourselves, am I doubting or am I trusting? Am I trusting God or am I doubting God and trusting man? When Asa took over one of these kingdoms, he trusted God. Like in the beginning, when he first was king, he trusted God, he was fully committed. That's why he removed the idols, he repaired the altar. He called the people back to worship together. Asa also trusted God when he was attacked by an enemy army. This army had twice the amount of warriors as Asa had. They had more warriors, more chariots, more weapons, but he trusts God and he cries out to God. We're gonna look back to chapter 14. And it says, then Asa, say this with me, cried out to the Lord his God. King Asa, 
who's all powerful, has all the authority, he cries out to God for help. And he says, oh Lord, no one but you can help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, oh Lord, your God. For we, say it with me, trust in you alone. He's saying, I am powerless. I'm powerless against this mighty army that's coming against me, against this battle in my life. I'm powerless without you, Lord, without my God. Asa cried out to the Lord. He was vulnerable. He was surrendered. And this was an act of worship. Now, I'm sure that this army sent word ahead to King Asa, probably even taunting him. You know, we're coming after you. And we have twice the number of warriors, more warriors, more chariots, more weapons. You might as well not even try. You might as well just give up. But Asa trusted God and he won the victory. Now, when I was a kid, I had a dream to be a cheerleader. I wanted to be a cheerleader. And when I was younger, my mom didn't want me to cheer. And so I had to wait until I was in ninth grade to try out. And I can remember uh, going into the gym when I, when I was trying out. I had to go into this gym and there was a panel of judges and I had to do a routine for them. But when I walked into the gym, I walked in there with a lot of doubts because I had never cheered before. I had some skill sets. I had done ballet. I had done gymnastics. I had even done a trick riding on horseback. So I had some skills. I had some talents, but I had never cheered before. And I was going up against girls who had been cheering together since kindergarten. So I walked in with some doubts. And the very first thing that I had to do in my routine was a round off. Now, a round off is very important because you go, you do the round off and that springs you into a backhand spring. So it's very important, but it's super simple. Probably the easiest thing I had to do in the entire routine. And if you don't know what a round off is, it's basically a cartwheel, but you land on two feet. Okay, so how to do this round off. The music starts, I run across the mat and I do my round off and I don't stick it, I fall. And I'm sitting on the mat, the music's still playing, and I'm so embarrassed. So I asked them, can I, can I do this again? Can I start over? And they said, yeah, you can, go ahead, start over. So I do the routine again, but do you think that I had more confidence the second time I did the routine? No. Because on top of doubts, now I've had a failure, right? And do you think I made the team? Yes, no, I heard both. No, I didn't make the team. And do you think I tried again? No, I didn't. Never tried again. I gave up. I lost my passion. My cheer career ended when I did not stick that round off. Doubt can cause you to lose your passion. But don't feel bad for me. I know some of you are like, oh no. It's okay. Because listen, in life, sometimes we don't make the team. Sometimes we don't get that job. Sometimes we don't get the friend. But in those times, the enemy is gonna come against you and put doubt in your head, especially if these are things that you have prayed for. And that doubt can cause you to lose your passion for God. In these times, you have to look the enemy in the eye and say, even if I will still worship my God. Now, later in Asa's life, he's facing yet another war, another enemy that is coming against him. This time, he's not trusting God. He's doubting. And here's this, this enemy is coming. It's actually King Basha. He's uh, the other, he took over the other kingdom, the kingdom that still is not uh, doing what's pleasing to God, is who's coming after him. And 
he hears about it and he's like, what do I do? Instead of turning to God, he takes care of it himself. He's like, I've got to protect the kingdom. I have to protect the people. I have to protect my family. I have to protect myself. So you know what he does? He goes into the treasury of the temple and he takes everything out of the treasury. He empties the treasury. He takes all of that stuff and he goes over here to another king, the king of Aram. This king is a pagan king. He's an enemy, an enemy to God's people. And he takes what belongs to God and he gives it to the enemy. And he aligns himself with the enemy because he says, I need your help. I need your help to defeat this army coming against me. And he aligns himself with a man instead of trusting God. Now God sends the prophet Hanani to Asa to speak to him about this. In verse seven, the prophet says to him, because you have put your trust in the king of Aram instead of in the Lord your God, you missed your chance, buddy. He says, you missed your chance to destroy the pagan king, to destroy that army, to take over that territory. If he had trusted God, not only would he have been able to defeat King Basha and taken back into, uh, make the two divided kingdoms back into one kingdom with one king and bring the people back together, but he also would have been able to take over the territory of the pagan king and bring them under God's rule. He missed his chance. He had doubts, but like we all have doubts. What happened to Asa? What happened to him? At this point, he has trusted God as king for about 36 years. And now he's doubting God. What happened? Scripture tells us that his kingdom and Asa experienced 10 years of peace. So in between the first war that we talked about and this war, there was 10 years of peace with no wars. During this time, Asa became complacent. Remember now, he, he's a good king and he is a godly man. Asa had passion for God. When he cried out to God, remember he cried out to God and he said, I trust in you alone. He was fully committed. But now he's become complacent. He got comfortable. And he just stopped needing God. And this can happen to any of us because we have our flesh and our spirit that is constantly at war. Our spirit wants us to be fully committed, but our flesh keeps us at war. And if you wanna test this out, go to Walmart on July 3rd. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. You're gonna get there on July 3rd and there's gonna be all these crowds of people you're not gonna be able to get through the aisles. You're gonna have to fight over that last package of buns. Then you're gonna to have to go and get in line. And it's gonna be a long line with lots of food in each basket, right? So you have to wait a long time. And when you get close to your turn at the checkout, one of two things is gonna happen. The person in front of you is either gonna pull out their coupons or they're gonna need a price check and your flesh is going to rise to the surface. And there is going to be a war between your flesh and your spirit. Your spirit's gonna be like, okay, now come on, let's hold it together. Remember, we're gonna be Christ-like. Remember the fruit of the spirit? Yeah, 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 okay, I remember the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, 
peace, patience. Wait a minute. I have no patience. I have no love. I have no joy. I have no peace because I am out of patience and I want out of here. Your flesh and your spirit are always at war. So we have to stay committed. Write this down. Am I complacent or committed? When you are not fully committed to the Lord, you have a divided kingdom within you and you will never have peace. And God is looking for those who are fully committed. Verse nine, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are, say it with me, fully committed. You know, I don't want God to have to search the whole earth to find someone who's fully committed. I wanna be that person. Are you with me? I want to be fully committed. But Asa was not fully committed. And the prophet tells him, what a fool you've been. From now on, you're gonna be at war. You're not going to have peace. Now God, he wanted to strengthen Asa. So it says he was looking for those who are fully committed to strengthen them. He wanted to strengthen his army. He wanted to strengthen his faith so that he would trust God and be fully committed. And God wants that for you. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to strengthen your trust and your commitment. When Asa was fully committed, he removed the idols. He repaired the altar. He called the people back together for worship. Because when we gather together, we are strengthened by the Lord. The people around you, they strengthen you. We build each other's faith. What I love about this place is you're sitting here today because you're fully committed, because you trust God and you build my faith. And together we build each other's faith. And if you are in a season of doubting or a season of complacency, this is where you will find your passion again. It's why we're here every week, amen? But Asa, he was so complacent, so self-satisfied, so full of pride that he would not listen to the prophet. In fact, he even turned against the prophet, the prophet that God sent to correct him and to return him to the altar of God. He turns against him. Verse 10, Asa became so angry with Hanani for saying this that he threw him into prison and he put him in stocks. At that time, Asa also began to oppress some of his people. His passion is gone. His passion for God is gone. His passion for God's people is gone. His passion for doing what's right is gone. This prophet is bringing a word from God and Asa rejects it. He does not return to the altar. Write this down. Am I rejecting or returning? Asa rejected God, but there is another man in history who didn't reject God, but returned to God. And that man is Asa's great, great grandpa. Do you know who Asa's great, great grandpa is? It's King David. A King David is, is also a good man, a godly man. He was a good king. But like Asa, he had sin. He did what was not pleasing to God. He had major sin. And just like Asa, God sent a prophet 
to speak to him, to bring him back to God. But David didn't reject the word. Asa returned to God. David does three things to return to the altar. And we see this biblical practice, this principle uh, in chapter seven, verse 14. It says, the Lord says, then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and restore their land. The three things that God calls us to do to return to the altar is to humble ourselves, to pray, and pray is to confess, and then to turn from sin, which is to repent. The first thing that David does is he humbled himself. He says, search my heart, O God, Like, search me. Show me where I'm offending you. Show me where I've I've made my mistakes. The second thing he does is he confesses. He says, I have sinned against my Lord. What I have done is not pleasing to God. And then he repents. And he says, create in me a clean heart. He's saying, change me, make me new again. He even says, renew a loyal spirit within me. This is turning away from what's not pleasing God and returning to the altar of worship. Now, if you have found yourself doubting and not trusting, God wants to strengthen you. He wants to strengthen your trust. And if you found yourself complacent and not fully committed, God wants to strengthen you. He wants to strengthen your commitment. And if you have found yourself rejecting God, rejecting and not returning, rejecting a word that God has given you, He wants you to return to the altar. He wants you to make him the center of your life. He wants you to make him the first thing in your life. And he's calling you today. He is speaking to you and he is saying, return to the altar. What is your response going to be? Are you going to reject Or are you going to return? Would you bow your heads with me? We're going to take some time now and just spend some time with God. This is a time for you to just push back the world. Push back the world. Don't think about what's coming next. Just sit in God's presence. Today, you might need some hope in your life. Like there's just, there's, you have doubts, but it's because there's things going on. There's battles, there's war, and you need hope. Just ask God now for that hope. Maybe today, You need healing. You need healing for your soul. If you are a follower of Jesus and God's been speaking to you because you've you've had some doubts, you've been doubting, you've been complacent, maybe you've even been rejecting And God's calling you to return to the altar. And you wanna, you wanna repent. You wanna confess that to God and repent and say, I'm coming back to the altar, God. 
If that's you, you're a follower of Jesus. I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm not gonna call you out. I just wanna know how to pray for you. If that's you, would you raise your hand? There's things in my life that I need to let go. I need to repent. I see you. I see all the hands over in the section. In the middle, I see you. On the other side in the section, I see you. In the middle, towards the back. If you're a follower of Jesus, I see you again over on this section. Follower of Jesus, I see your hand. I see your hand. I want to repent, God. I want to repent. Raise your hand if you want to repent. I see you in the back row. I see you over here, second row. Maybe today you're, you're not a follower of Jesus. You've just not taken that step to say, I, I, want, I want to follow Jesus. I want Jesus to be my Lord and my Savior. But God's speaking to you and you wanna turn away from all the doubts that you've had. You know, I, I'm gonna tell you, the doubts aren't gonna go away. They're not gonna go away. We just keep pressing forward. So if you're not a follower of Jesus and today you want him to be your Lord and Savior, will you raise your hand? I'm not gonna embarrass you. I see your hand. I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm not gonna call you out. I see you on the second row. Today is your day. Lord Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. Maybe today it's peace. You just need peace. Like you have doubts because of what's raging, what's going on in your life. And you just, you need a season of peace. Just ask him for that. Or maybe it's purpose. God, I, I need to find my purpose again. I need to find my passion first so I can have a purpose. Ask him for that. Give that to him. God, I thank you today. I thank you today for you giving us the grace to confess. And I thank you for giving us mercy as we repent. God, I thank you for changed lives. I thank you for the, the lives that said, I want Jesus to be my Savior. And God, I thank you for the word today. I ask that it goes with us throughout this next week and that the change that begins today continues. God, call us back. Continue to call us back. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope this message today has encouraged and inspired you. If you don't have a church home, we'd love for you to join us Sundays at 10 a.m. And if we can support you or encourage you or help you in any way, please use any of the links that are in the description. Thanks again for joining us online. We pray you have a great week.